Boxing Legends of the Ring. That is a very fitting name for this very interesting video game. I look forward to play. We'll see how that goes. I, it's promising. It's a promising video game, but um, let's look at what's even more promising. The premises for this game, right? It's called Boxing Legends of the Ring for a reason. This is not Toughman Contest, Zenki. Alright, Boxing Legends of the Ring is a Sega Genesis game that releases exclusively for the North American market in October 1993. It did, however, also release specifically in uh, Mexico. November 1994, so that's uh, a full year afterwards, under the name of Chavitz 2. Chavitz being a Mexican boxer legend, basically, that we'll look into later for sure. I don't know if it's in the vanilla game, so to speak. Both versions, of course, come in a 1 megabyte ROM, or 8 megabits if you're feeling retro and cool. The video game was developed for both the Sega Mega Drive and the Super Nintendo by Sculpture Software, whom we already covered. But the Super Nintendo, a Japanese release, was also produced under the title of Final Knockout. Now, I included some sculpture software lore, but it's basically a repeat from when we played Super WrestleMania, but long story short, it was a company founded in 1984, was headquartered in Salt Lake City in the Utah, and over the years they developed over 130 games under the name of Sculpture Software alone. Their studio, being so successful and busy between its own games and numerous sports, gathered much attention and was eventually bought by Acclaim in 1995. At that time, Acclaim had already acquired Probe Entertainment and Iguana Entertainment. Remember Iguana? Uh, what we played? We played, uh, we played uh, Pirates of the Dank Water and uh, I think NBA Gem was also... Its Mega Drive version was also developed by Iguana. So they shifted the name towards Acclaim Studios, right? <clears throat> Interestingly, this logo would retain the Iguana Entertainment mascot, which is an Iguana. <laughs> Sculpture Software, however, kept their brand on the games, but in 1999 it would become Acclaim Studios Salt Lake City. 2002, however, the studio was shut down and absorbed into Acclaim Studios Austin. The only resting title to come out under that brand, in fact, would be released two years later under the name of Showdown Legends of Wrestling. Why are we talking about wrestling now? Because this is lore I wrote when we were playing WWF, Super WrestleMania, and Sculpture Software did a shitload of wrestling games. But enough of that. Let's talk about the good part. Let's talk about the fucking boxers. What's going on, Dan? What's going on, Narcotion? What's going on, Red Funk? Good to see everybody. Now, the video game has a marvelous character roster comprising of some of the most legendary middleweight boxers of all times. I figure it would be cool if we actually have a text saying who the boxer we're currently talking about is. All right, let's, let's try this, hold on. I just told this up. I'm imp improvising. Improvising. All right, so. Let's try, uh, let's try here. Ah. Uh, this is not gonna work. All right, hold on. I'm gonna make it work. Okay, do this, do this. All right, this box we're talking about is Marvelous Marvin Hagler. That's his name. He legitimately changed it to Marvelous himself. All right, put it there. Marvelous Marvin Hagler. Born Marvin Nathaniel Hagler, the 23rd of May 1954, the Marvelous competed from 1973 to 1987, but not before an astounding amateur career with a 55-1 record. That's 55 wins, one loss. Hagler is known for his long dominance from 1980 to 1987 as the undisputed middleweight champion. During his reign, he had 12 successful and consecutive defenses, which puts him in number 2 for longest championship reign behind Zo uh, Tony Zale. 
Another curious fact is that in 1982, he changed his name legally to Marvelous Marvin Hagler, supposedly annoyed about the fact that the announcers would not use his nickname, The Marvelous, that much. Hey, Skip Natty. Hmm. He was actually Marvelous. There's a reason um, he's basically the first in the roster. Now here, the real focal point that we should touch talking about Marvelous is how it's it's about the rivalry between Marvelous Marvin Hagler and Sugar Ray Leonard, whom we'll cover, of course, because there's also a character in the game, and the implications that this rivalry had with the media and in and, and the video game. In fact, the Marvelous reign ended as Sugar Ray Leonard won against him by a split decision in one of the most discussed results of all times. Hagler even claimed Leonard would have told him right after the 12th and final round you beat me, man. Said meant that Sugar Ray Leonard would have himself denied after the judge's result, claiming that he had only said, you are a great champion. The HBO cameras and microphones, though, which you can see in the game, the HBO sponsorship and everything, they seem to support Hagler's version. We got some... Um, we got some of this, actually. Look at that. Related... Related media here at Goji Stream. Now, Hagler's professional record, which ends with that loss, stands at 62 3 2. 62 wins, 3 losses, 2 draws. With 52 KO wins, and with the 3 losses being by decision. So, Marvelous Marvin Hagler has never lost a professional boxing match by knockout. I sure don't know if his one amateur loss was by knockout, probably not, so... Mm. Hagler would try to no avail to get rematch out of Sugar Leonard, who was already rusty when he got to the fight, as he had recently came out of the second out of his five high-profile retirements with a drama queen. Would have gone to the third retirement after the fight, basically. Marvelous then retired in June 1988 and started working as an actor in Italy. <laughs> I shit you not. I shit you not. An offer for a rematch, though, would actually come in 1990 from Leonard, but it was declined as Hagler has had already like put that behind him. Interestingly, though, the two did have a rematch in Boxing Legends of the Ring. They actually played a match against themselves, against each other, for the Consumer Electronics Show in 1994. I was not able to find that, but I would like to. But they played one another in the video game with their own characters. It's kind of like when Mike Tyson um, uh, did his own thing, right? Yeah, when you play Mike Tyson's punch out, is what I meant. <clears throat> Now, Marvel's Marvin Hagler starred in the 1989 movie Indio, directed by Antonio Margheriti, and its sequel, Indio 2, La Rivolta, Indio 2, La Rivolta, Indio 2, the, the riot, the rebellion. And, and don't I have something for you guys right now? Do I not? Do I not have something for you guys right now? Do I not? Do I, yeah, just looking for the... There you go. I do have something for you guys. I do. First in the fucking intro, first thing to pop out. Marvelous Marvin Hagler. One of the most famous boxes in the history of the sport. Starred in this movie called Indio and its sequel. And not much aside from that. Pretty interesting movie, I suppose. Let's uh, skip to a scene where we're all gonna have fun looking at the scene. 
you son of a bitch. Anyway, kid is out there someplace. But make sure he understands about the money. He can do a hell of a lot more for his people with that money than he can waging this ridiculous war, which he's gonna lose sooner or later. How do you figure I'm finding him anyway? I'll let him find me. How are you gonna do that, marvelous? By whistling? <laughs> well, that's gonna work, isn't it? How's it going, kid? <laughs> Shit. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I know you're here. Come on, let's talk. <laughs> oh, you're sneaky, Daniel. Don't worry, don't worry. I'm clean. Hey, you really got these people running scared. <laughs> I'm proud of you. You didn't come here to congratulate me, did you, Sarge? No, that's true. I'm here. Well, that's that's India with marvelous Marvin Hagler, everybody. Also, the sequel, actually, of course. Uh, I, th I think they had a really good scene. Hold on a second. Yep. I'll let them find it. Hey, just show us the name. Let's see his name. Dude, shit. What's this? What's this start? <laughs> Let's put in the, the actors' names. So just kill the, the Indian guy from the first movie, <laughs> from what I gathered from the previous scene. Fucking gonna take him, take take his scalp. Was a title seed. Hey, Ipo. <laughs> this movie rules. <laughs> oh, shit. Ah, there you go. Boom. In your duel, I revolve. Oh, this one is Italian. Is it? God 
Look at him go, dude. Spoilers, it's the ending. <laughs> I forgot to update the lower pace bin link. But then now I should. Let's do that again. This is Marvelous Marvin Hagler, the most famous boxers. This is best movie scene. We've seen enough, guys. <laughs> Fuck yeah. That ruled. That was really good. That was really good. <clears throat> so we're talking about the rivalry between him, of course, and uh, Sugar Ray Leonard, which is the box we're going to cover next. Destiny at Cease's main event. All right. So let's take care of this instead now. Yeah, it's good enough. Going mm. on, Atomic Runner, Blix Krieger, welcome, Hammerite. That was a really good punch. That was a really good punch. All right. So, Ray Charles Leonard, Ray Charles Leonard, nicknamed Sugar, was born in North Carolina, USA, on the 17th of May, 1957. He made his professional debut in 1977 and competed until 1997 across five different weight divisions. His birth name is a tribute to his mother's favorite singer here. Of course. Now, his name and personality, and also Marvel's Marvin Hagler's, those are associated with that, uh, with those of the Fabulous Four. It's kind of a shitty picture, but it's like a cover of some book, I guess, or a VHS, maybe. Along with Roberto Duran and Thomas Hearns, which we will cover, uh, Sugar Leonard and Marvel's Marvin Hagler. Or high-profile, lower-weight boxers 
that kept that category, a specific category of boxing, distinct, popular, and afloat. Leonard's uh, professional boxing record stands at 36 wins, 3 losses, and 1 draw. With 25 KO wins and 1 KO loss. It's not the biggest record, but still. It wasn't really about quantity for him. Now, his career as a professional boxer came only after an Olympic gold medal. As the US light welterweight representative in 1976, Leonard won all of his five matches with a 5 0 decision. His amateur career was also strong by then, with 165 wins against five losses, with 75 KOs. But after winning his match to gold medal, which he really strived for, it was like his dream. He announced that was it. His dream was fulfilled and that he just wanted to attend college to study business administration and communications. We, we actually have a video of... Uh, the whole thing. Went to Cuban. A surprise to everybody. Because the referee was in the act of talking to Sugar Ray, but there was no caution, no deduction of points or anything else. And so the whole crowd was stunned by the suddenness of it. There's a good right lead. He's hurt again. Ray. He's hurt again indeed. He's staggering. Good. Stylesmakefights.com. <laughs> good overlay. Got to work the opponent. Pick his spots. All it takes is one punch by the Cuban and the fight can be over also. Right, we're not going to watch the entire of this. But uh, you look at the guy on the right. That's surely Leonard. Short, crisp, direct anymore. Power. Look at how sluggish, how leaden the arms seem. This brilliant young fighter. With a right lead and then a left. Cleaning up. The Cuban is ready to go. The referee stops the contest. The crowd goes wild. Trey Leonard, a former Park Barrel, will go to the University of Maryland now. His dream is realized as he has won himself a gold medal. And it's a standing ovation for the terrorized. Olympic gold. Olympic gold. All right. <clears throat> Where were we? Now, the high education plans that uh, Sugar Ray Leonard had, they, they were destined to be scrapped though, as um, he could not get the big endorsements he was hoping for. His father and mother became unable to work due to meningitis for the first and a heart attack for the second. Now, the reason for the commercial failures, so to speak, was due to the bad reputation that he uh, got following a civil paternity suit filed uh filed by his girlfriend now sugar leonard had not married uh his girlfriend yet due to the incoming olympics but basically uh it's it's kind of complicated for me to understand but basically he was being asked 156 dollars per month for child support but it's like the state was asking them or something, but anyway, that gave him a bad rep and he was not able to get the sponsorships desired and thus uh, not really able to live off of that uh, Olympic gold medal. Now what happened then, Leonard pursued a professional career in boxing in order to support his family. Sugar Leonard's training would be overseen by Angelo Dundee. Over here. On the left, of course. <clears throat> Who was Muhammad Ali's trainer? There you go. Now, his first world-class fight would be his 14th one, as he fought Floyd Mayweather, ranked 17th at the time, and beat him by KO in the 10th run. Now, this, this, the stupid nickname of uh, Sugar Ray Leonard stems from one of his coaches in the Olympic team who would have said that uh, the kid you got there is as sweet as sugar. 
which as we will see is not very original. Anyway, given a similar style and a name coincidence, people started calling him Sugar Ray, just like the the famous the famous Sugar Ray Robinson. It's very convenient for me as I only have to change one word. So we're kind of going back and forth with the times here. We got a black and white picture now for the boxes portrait. Now, now Robinson competed from 1940 to 1965, and oddly enough, his name is even less original than Sugar Ray Leonard. In fact, when he was 18, he wasn't able to participate in this tournament I wanted to participate in because he was too young. So he got around the AAU age restriction by borrowing a birth certificate from a friend whose name was Ray Robinson. Now, a lady in the audience would mention him being sweet as sugar, somehow that's a thing in English, hence the nickname. So, it's basically, it's named after a document that it kind of stole from a friend or something. Well, he borrowed. I'm sorry. Now, his real name is Walker Smith Jr., born on the 3rd of May, 1921. It's considered one of the best boxers of all times, with a professional record of 174 wins. 174 wins, 19 losses, 6 rows. And the third longest unbeaten streak that lasted for 91 fights from 1943 to 1951. Now, given Smith's bouts in the welterweight and middleweight classes, sports talk personalities started introducing the term pound for pound. <laughs> Chubo, what's going on? Thank you very much for the precious uh, 22 months. I kind of got music in my headphones to do the noise, so I don't get too distracted. Thanks for the resub, Chubo. Now, sports talk personalities due to this guy start introducing the, the term you hear a lot these days in boxing circumstances which is pound for pound strength and eventually they started ranking fighters relatively to their weight which is basically uh what that means basically like ranking a boxer relatively to how much he weighs so like uh this this guy might be ranking higher than uh, mike tyson for example pound by pound i don't actually know if that's the case but the website to go to for that kind of stuff is box rack I think it's dot com now <clears throat> when this guy was competing those were a pretty old and uh dark days as in the 40s the mafia controlled much of the boxing robinson was initially unable to get a shot at the welterweight championship belt in 1946 even though he had a record of 73 1 1 He was eventually granted the chance on the 20th of December 1946 where he fought a close bout with Tommy Bell and won by a 15 round decision. His first defense though, his first defense of the title was one of the most meaningful moments in Smith's life and career and Sugar Ray Robinson's life and career as he would have dreamt of killing his opponent, Jimmy Doyle, on the left which prompted Sugar Ray Robinson to, to back out from the fight. Right, he dreamt of killing his opponent, and so he, he didn't want to fight. He was eventually convinced to fight, but his dream would come true, as Doyle, getting knocked down in the eighth round, would lose his life later that night. Smith then learned of his opponent's intention to buy his mother a new house and spent his next four bouts prizes Tours fulfilling that. He eventually moved on to the middleweight class due to how hard it was to stay below the 67 kilogram welterweight limit. And it was a good boot. Strong names were around that class at that time, so there was more money to be made. He would conquer the world middleweight title on the 14th of February 1951 
fighting for the sixth time his rival, Jake LaMotta. Sugar Ray Robinson's professional record, as we mentioned, stands at 174 wins, 19 losses, 6 draws, with 109 KO wins, and just the 1 KO loss. His amateur record was of 85 wins, 0 losses. We're going to be talking about another boxer, again, featured in the, this video game, who is the one we're going to be playing as. Because his movie is one of my favorite movies. Talking about the Bronx Bull, talking about the Raging Bull, talking about Jake LaMotta. Jake LaMotta. Now let's try to put this. Really old time boxing here. Exactly, Robert De Niro, exactly. Great fucking movie. Jacob Bellamotta. Jacob Bellamotta was born on the 10th of July, 1922, in the New York Bronx. Apparently, he was put up by his father to fight other kids, to put up a show on the streets and earn some money. Little Jake, later nicknamed the Raging Bull, developed a violent temper. No surprise there. At the age of 19, Lamata had his professional debut and quickly became known for his resilience of all things. He achieved further recognition by inflicting the first defeat ever to Sugar Ray Robinson in 1943. But not before losing to him himself. So the two had this rival, rival, rivalry. And Jake Lamata was the first ever to defeat Sugar Ray Robinson by many considered the best boxer of all time. Though those were different times, I imagine. I imagine 70 years ago, boxing was different, guys. Now, in 1949, Lamata got his title bout against Marcel Sardin. Marcel Sardin? It's French, guys. I don't speak French. That was possible after not only paying twenty thousand dollars to the mafia so here it is it wasn't able normally to 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 challenge a champion right he had to pay twenty thousand dollars to the mafia but he also had to throw a match against billy fox it was a really obvious match that it, he tried it it, 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 it it was thrown right gave away it was it was really really obvious he later admitted to all of this, claiming that it, he panicked in the first round against Billy Fox after throwing a couple of jabs to Fox's head and noticing a glassy look coming over his eyes already. Lamotta managed to defeat the French champion anyway, Marcel Sudan, who dislocated his arm in the first round and quit the fight before the start of the 10th one. The Raging Bull then became middleweight champion in June 1949. A rematch was scheduled with Sir Don. Can I go back and forth with the pictures here? I should just freaking... There you go. That's bad. Oh, dude, look at OBS. Look, look at these effects. Oh, I'm gonna do this now as I speak. <laughs> oh, shit. Alright, hold on. Where was I? Rematch was scheduled with Sudan, but unfortunately, the former champion died in an airplane crash aboard an Air France Lockheed Constellation due to pilot's failure to identify the airport location. There's other personalities in that flight. There was a famous uh, violin player and there was a, a marketing Disney figure who basically made Mickey Mouse successful or something. They all died. In 1951, sorry, 1951, he had his sixth match against Sugar Ray Robinson, a bout which became known as the St. Valentine's Day Massacre of Boxing. Amata took a horrible beating during the last few rounds, and the fight was stopped by the 13th round with a losing champion on the ropes. Although defeated, Lamotta still never went down in his career, 
at that point still, not counting the bout thrown to Fox. Was the name of the bass fishing dude who also died in a plane crash? Challenging me to remember some lore. I don't, but let's see how long I take to find it again. His name was... Kirchel. Brian Kirchel. There you go. You're welcome. <clears throat> now, the time where Jake LaModa would actually go down would come on the, tre on the 31st of December, 1952, during Lamotta's last fight before we took a year off, was against Danny Nardico, and after the Raging Bull had moved up to the light heavyweight class following his title loss. He would return in 1954, but finally retired after a controversial split decision loss on his third match. Now, based, based on this, Based on his 1970 autobiography, Raging Bull, My Story, one of the finest movies of all times was produced. Raging Bull. Hold on, I got this. Raging Bull, directed by Martin Scorsese and starring Robert De Niro as Jake LaMotta, was initially not a big success and was also about to be cancelled at some point. However, it gained immense critical acclaim in short time. Uh, rightfully so, you guys should watch the movie, it's, it's really great. The movie masterfully depicts the character of La Mota for the big screen. Only in the ring, where De Niro trained personally with La Mota, until La Mota felt like De Niro was ready to box, professionally. But at home, too. It depicted the character of La Mota perfectly at home as well too, where the Raging Bull's violent nature basically wrecks his own family and where Joe Pesci plays the part of his reasonable brother. Also notably, very notably, which you will remember if you watch the movie, an older La Mota is portrayed in his post-boxing years as a comedian, with Danilo gaining 60 pounds just in order to portray that. They ate for like 60 days, two months, I don't remember how much time, but he dined in Paris' finest restaurants just to become that fat. Look at that fat Bob the Niro on the right, dude. I don't think he's ever been that fat. The movie was fully filmed in black and white, and it came out in 1980. Definitely recommend watching this movie. It's one of my favorite movies of all times, and I'm not a particular uh, boxing fan. At all. Hey, Helical. Wow. Yeah, we we talked about Sugar Lee Leonard um, a little bit ago. For sure. We're gonna, we're gonna punch his guts in the, in the video game. <laughs> Lamata's professional record stands at 83-19-4. It's 83 wins, 19 losses, 4 draws. With 30 KO wins and 4 KO losses. You see, that's not a KO wins compared to the other guys that we've seen. Yeah. It's really resilient fighter. Very... I can... It's called, like, not just um, the Raging Bull or the Bronx Bull, but also the Bully. Anyway, let's move on to the next boxer, who's also another Italo-American boxer. His name is Rocky Graziano. Damn. <laughs> damn, Helical, damn. I actually used to work with a guy who boxed Sugar Ray Leonard back in the amateur circuit. He said that Leonard beat him so bad that he quit on the spot. He never boxed again after that. <laughs> Damn it. The Raging Gun. I'm gonna be playing as the Raging Bull Hippo just because of the movie. I don't have any attachment to, to any other boxer in this. Well, I, I guess I wanna play as Marvel's Marvin Aguilar after the fucking Italian movies. <laughs> it's fucking. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> fucking Indio Duel Rivolta, dude. I gotta watch that fully. That last fighting scene is absurd. 
Uh, Rocky Graziano, born Thomas Rocco Barbella, January the 1st, 1990. He was another Italian American boxer with a troubled childhood, a very troubled early life. His father would have boxing gloves around the house, and while Rocky was just three, he would put him up against his older brother of six years to practice by fighting each other. He got into amateur boxing with much ta talent, but without wanting too much to do with routine training and severe regimes. He still won the 1939 Metropolitan AAU Welterweight Championship and sold the gold medal for $15. At that point, he started developing a taste for boxing money that probably wasn't enough for the turbulent young man, as he was soon busted for stealing. That's how he ended up spending six months in reformatory. During the first part of this period, he spent three weeks at the Coxsackie Correctional Facility, together with his old friend, Jake LaMotta. They, 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 they met again in reformatory. Once out of there, he got back into the gym, where Eddie Coco would make him a professional boxer under the name of Robert Barber. Which fits, you know, his, his real name was Rocco Barbella. So Robert Barber kind of fits. fits. However, it was only a couple of weeks before he would again get into trouble and from a reform school, he moved on to jail this time. Once out, he got into the military but sucked a captain in the face, escaping four dicks in New Jersey. That's where he started boxing as Rocky Graziano under his coach, Irving Cohen. Irving? Irving. This man, Irving Cohen, was sensible enough to try and play around Barbella's insufferance for strict training. He also changed his name to Graziano, his grandfather's last name. Cohen tried to match Graziano over stronger opponents, so much so that he even tried to get a bout with Sugar Ray Robinson. This was in an attempt to get Graziano to suffer a loss, so that that loss would have uh, taught him the value of training feel that uh, grammar error there. However, Graziano won his first matches with major upsets, <laughs> much to the, to the surprise of his own coach, which was trying to get him to lose. As his name started gaining popularity, the military found him after his fourth bout. He ran away again, but returned a few days later to turn himself in. He was then pardoned. He had even more troubles with the law, but was a legendary boxer and what is called a knockout artist. And his professional record testifies to that. Rocky's professional record stands at 67, 10, 6, with 52 KO wins and 3 KO losses. That is 67 wins, out of which 52 were KO wins. Again, I play as Rocco. Yeah, he had been a wrestler before, but got tired of it. So his dad suggested he boxed instead. He was very good, but obviously Leonard was a different animal. Yeah. Yeah, what the fuck is up with Lamata's resilience? <laughs> it did. Lamata died in 2017 uh, at age 95, despite being the guy that definitely got punched in the head way harder than any other out of all of this game's roster. Anyway. Speaking of getting punched really hard, or rather, punching really hard. Ah, oh, damn it. I was still having Jake Lamada's name under here. This was Rocky Graziano, guys. We're talking about Rocky Graziano, not Jake Lamada. Now, I'm gonna move on to Roberto Duran from Panama. 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 Roberto Hands of Stone Duran, nicknamed Manos de Piedra. Roberto Duran Samaniego was born on the 16th of June 1951 in Panama. He was one of the best lightweight boxers of all times and had a reputation for holding world championship belts in four different weight classes, light, welter, light middleweight and middleweight. He also competed from 1968 to 2001, which is a feat to behold. He was involved in a car crash accident in October 2001, which prompted him to definitely retire at the age of 50. 
Following his debut, Duran started proving himself as a winning machine. He won his first 31 fights. He got the title in June 1972 and made 12 successful defenses of it. He vacated the title in February 1979 to build up for his shift to the welterweight class. He soon got a couple of high-level wins against former champions, and then gained a shot at a bout against the undefeated Sugar Ray Leonard. Duran had a record of 71 wins and one loss at that point. Sugar Ray Leonard was defeated by a unanimous decision after the full 15 round stretch. The fight was known as the Brawl in Montreal. Let's get that straight. In the rematch that same year, Leonard switched the tactics though and used more footwork. He also taunted his opponent while ahead on the scorecards. Duran stopped fighting in the middle of the 8th round, famously saying no mas. I guess it's no mas pronounced, which means no more. In a recent interview though, Duran revealed that what he said was instead no sigo, I won't go on, I won't continue. After taking some time following the lost rematch with Sugar Ray Leonard, Hands of Stone started competing in the middleweight class, initially with scar success. <clears throat> the comeback came though, and eventually he won his WBA light middleweight title on his 32nd birthday. Hold on, I, I got some, some videos here. But this guy. <clears throat> right, where were we? He later fought for the World Middleweight Championship 2 against Marvel's Marvin Hagler, aka the guy in India 2, Arivolta. This fight was notable for being the second time anyone had ever taken Hagler to a 15 round match before, and the only time that that had happened. While Marvelous was world champion, Roberto Duran also broke his own hand during that fight. Now, his WBA title was nullified once he stepped into the ring versus Thomas Hearns. I think it's Hearns, might be Hearns, Hearns, I don't know. Duran has been, had, mm, sorry, Duran had been irresponsibly parting that period, and during camp training he had to focus on losing weight more than anything else. Hearns famously destroyed Duran after two rounds, being the first man to knock out Manos de Piedra. Duran's professional record stands at 103 wins, 16 losses and 0 draws, with 70 KO wins and 4 KO losses. This is the match against Thomas Hearns, where Durant got destroyed in the second round. Thanks, Chester. That's Roberto Duran on the left. The challenger, fighting out of Panama City, Panama. Age 32 at this point. Whereas his opponent would uh, go on and become another legend. We've been going to be talking about him next. He is a man with the hands of stone, Roberto Seven years younger than his opponent. Wins, 
is Thomas Hearn's nickname Hitman. He is also featured in this video game. I'm gonna be talking about him next. Watch how he fights because it's pretty, pretty, pretty good. I bet most people in chat have, but some people in chat have read or watched the Hajime no Hippo uh, anime manga. Remember that guy who swings his forward arm like this? Yeah, he's doing that a lot here. Yeah, Skip Natty definitely so explosive. This match will not last long. Round number one. Carlos Padilla is the referee. He will not score. Harry Gibbs from England. Newton Campos from Brazil. Hans Gisbert from Belgium will be the scoring judges on the 10 point must system. Nine or fewer points to the loser of a round. Tim Roberto Duran has a real heavy beard. In most states, uh, that's illegal. I'm surprised that. Uh, Emmanuel Stewart didn't complain to the commission about that. Well, Thomas Hearns has a real light beer, so... Well, <laughs> What's so illegal the again? Championship has gone to Roberto, but I, your point is quite uh, well taken, Gil, uh, and we'll see if it has an effect that you can pick up in terms of uh, Hearns landing his blow to the face of Duran. A little tentative here in the early going, and uh, Duran having... Growing a beard is illegal, I didn't know that. Yeah, that makes sense. Normally they don't have beards. Now that I think about it. At the time of the bell for the first round here in Las Vegas with the sun starting to sink in the west. Tim Ryan and Gil Clancy, round one scheduled for 12, remember under WBC rules, it's 12 round title bout. Tim, Tommy Hearns should be working that jab overtime. Instead, he's looking to land the big bomb. And he landed a good right hand. A good right hand to the ear of Duran that sent him back into the ropes. Of course, Camacho Duran quickly saying, it didn't hurt me. There's that left jab of Hearns backing up Roberto Duran. But Duran is making a mistake, Tim, of standing straight up. He's fighting a tall guy. He should get lower. He's not going to be able to reach up for Hearns. He's got to slip the punches, get underneath him. Can't get his head moved back at that jab, or he's really going to get nailed. Under a minute to go, and Duran slipped. However, there is blood over the right, the left oh, eye, pardon me, the left eye of Roberto oh, Duran. A slice it looks it like it's on the eyelid in the corner of the left eye of Roberto Duran. And Hearns is backing Roberto Duran up at will. A solid right, and down goes Duran. Duran is on That guy punches so fucking hard. Him. He's very seldom ever he's putting a fight. Hearns lands a combination and Duran waving at him to come at him, but meanwhile taking punishment. Down he goes again. That's, that's going to save him, Tim. That's by, by the fact that he went down, the bell is going to ring. Got quickly to the six to his feet at the end of the first round. And he must finish the eight count, and there is the bell that ends round number one. The bell does not end the round, and he went to the neutral corner. Roberto Duran went to the neutral corner. He did not realize where his corner is, so Duran is in deep trouble. So, famously here, uh, Duran was mistaken his corner's positioning. Let's look at that first knockdown, Tim. Here's Roberto Duran standing straight as a stick, right in front of Tommy Hearns. Hearns is measuring him now, weaves a little bit, and bang, right on the chin with a good right hand. Tremendous shot by Thomas Hearns. And he Wait, this guy's got monstrous arms to like of absurd length. Durant Look how long Thomas Hearns fucking Durant. arms are. You don't want to get feasted by that, if you know what I mean. I mean boxing, right? A tremendous body punch, another body punch, slips him right off his feet, Tim, and down again. 
All right, second round. <laughs> Cheeky. <laughs> down to round one. It remain to be seen. He looks still a little wobbly to me, Joe. Yeah, he's still straight up in the air, Tim. You have to get low when you fight a fighter like Tommy Hearns. To the left and a right behind it by the champion. Damn. Duran in trouble again in his corner. Has not hung on at all. Now, finally, he grabbed Hearn. Hearn's got look at several free shots with Roberto. He's wobbly, Jim. His legs are still wobbly. He's trying to cover up. Another solid right hand by Thomas Hearns in a combination. The referee Padilla watching. There he's up in the air again. Duran just fighting on instinct, though, Gil. He's just hanging a big that's right it. hand. That's, that's it, Tim. I a huge you right hand. Forward, the fight's over, Tim. A huge right hand by Thomas Hearns. Right to the cheekbone. That's it, Tim. Duran, and it is all over. A second round knockout for the hitman, Thomas Hearns who said he would knock out Duran in two, and he did just that. He sure did, Tim. We've said so many times before, a fighter can go into the ring and he can age overnight. And that's exactly what happened to Roberto Duran. He didn't have it from the open. It's uh, Thomas Hearns, everybody. Tonda. Thomas Hitman Hearns. Thomas Hearns, born on the 18th of October 1958 in Memphis, Tennessee, the United States, takes Duran's varied weight class record a step further. A Hitman was, in fact, world champion in five different weight categories welterweight, light middleweight, middleweight, light heavyweight and super middleweight, as you can see in this picture. He was one of the hardest hitting punchers in boxing history and knocked out future Hall of Famers and notable boxers such as Roberto Duran and Pipino Cuevas. Seemingly unstoppable and at a 32 wins and zero losses record with 30 KO wins, which is unbelievable. Hearns had a world welterweight bout known as the showdown against Sugar Lee Leonard. Me a while to find that. Sugar Gate, Sugar. Uh. <laughs> Sugar Ray Leonard, not Sugar Gay. Uh, Freudian lapses happens when you like the dick a lot. Sugar Ray Leonard would give um, Thomas Hearns his first professional defeat, knock him in out in the 14th round. Hearns, after knocking out the legendary Roberto Duran, eventually fought Hagler too, better known as. Indio due la rivolta, Marvin, marvelous Hagler here. They would fight Hagler as well, giving life to what was known as the war, about known as the war. The fight ended in Marvelous's favor, but Hearns earned even more respect, and the two achieved an immense popularity with that rich super stat superstar status. Hearns' career, as you can imagine from this picture, was all in the five championship belts that we mentioned before, is illustrious. It would be too much to talk about, so we'll be content with touching these couple of spots that we just touched. His professional record stands at 61 wins, 5 losses, 1 draw, with 48 KO wins and 4 KO losses. Benjamin Amore, what's going on? Welcome, Benjamin. Next up, last but not least, or is it the last one? Maybe not. It's James Lights Out Tony.
Perhaps the only one on this roster to rival Jake LaMotta for resilience, if not beating him in, it, in that. But we're talking extremely different times. This guy could have been the, grand, the grandson of Jake LaMotta, probably. As James Nathaniel Tony was born on the 24th of August, 1968. So definitely. And competed from 1988 to 2017, which is the year when Jake LaMotta died, apparently. With a record of 77 wins, 10 losses, 3 draws. With 47 KO wins and 0 KO losses. Tony is easily the most recent boxer out of this game selection. Reps' most interesting enterprise is his determination to compete in the heavyweight division. One of the three classes in which he held world titles in. Held, but not kept. As... His heavyweight title that won, uh, he won in 2005 was later nullified following a failed drug test, resulting positive for the anabolic steroid Stanozolol. 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 He, however, fought 15 world title bouts across four different weight divisions. Also nicknamed the Dark Emperor, Tony's professional record, I uh, already said that, Got a duplicate here. Tony's professional record proves the value of his defensive and technical style, of course. As really zero KO losses. That's pretty good. So that would normally conclude uh, this video game's boxing roster, but remember how he mentioned that uh, Boxing Legends of the Rings, which is a North American exclusive, also got a Mexican release called Chavez 2. Yeah. We're going to be talking about Chavez as well. Chavez. Chavez. I don't know how to pronounce that. All right. Julio Cesar Chavez Gonzalez, the senior of the two Chavez, is a Mexican boxer who competed from 1980 to 2005. And Boxing Legends of the Rings, of course, has its Mexican release named after him. Chavez? Biopolis? Chavez? No, that's not true. His records are incredible particularly pertaining to his title defenses. He had an 87 win streak shortly before his first defeat at the hands of Frankie Randall in 1994. This guy competed from 1980 to 1994 without being defeated. <laughs> is, that, is that legit or is that like freaking, I don't know dude. This is set up to be that successful because I it's this is this is among all the boxes that we've seen, this boxer who is not actually in the video game unless you play in the Mexican version, which is named after him, this is the boxer with the most ridiculous records. This is the one that obliterates every other record basically on the planet. Chavez won six world belts in three different classes, all below the middleweight class. He was said to have one of the strongest chin in boxing history. Actually, I didn't write that down. Let me write that down. Uh, one of the strongest chins in the history of boxing. Now, I haven't checked, but I'm pretty sure all the boxers discussed, dis discussed here are Hall of Famers. The only Mexican exclusive on a Sega console. I don't believe you. How about Chavez 1? <laughs> Where was Chavez 1? I imagine that was a Master System game, but I don't actually know. Yeah, I figured that would be the case, Dan. Otherwise, it's, I mean, right? And he had a kid who's a disgrace to his boxing legacy. Why? Was this some drama involved or was it just not as good? Chavez Jr. There you go, Dan Skipnani coming through with the 
actually educated lore. All right. So that concludes the boxing shock and the Mexico shock. Hope you enjoyed this dive phase first in the history of uh, some of the most influential boxes, especially in the middleweight class. I suppose what this game is trying to do is trying to pick a, a, a category, which is the middleweight kind of, and uh, make realistic bouts between uh, the best fighters like that. It doesn't try to have. Um, I actually know if like you play career mode, like it's just career mode and there's legends mode. So maybe legends mode, you see all the different boxes, but maybe in career mode, it's like realistic. Like if you, if you're playing as Jake Lamotta, you're not going to be facing, um, James Tony who competed much later. I don't know. I'm looking forward to how career mode works, career mode and, and, uh, boxing video games or something like that. Like games like that is is extremely interesting to me. All right, let's talk about uh, Sound Shock. It's in Sound Shock going on. Chavez one was ridiculous boxing on the Game Gear. But Chavez one was only released in Mexico for the Super Nintendo version. Wait. Did you say it was a Game Gear game? How was it also a Super Nintendo game? <laughs> Fabulous four had losses because they fought each other. Boxing records are mostly bullshit. Yeah, I that's it's um that's a good take, I feel. I'm uneducated in boxing. Now I am a bit. But uh that that seems like a very good take. I like that guy recently, Floyd Mayweather Jr., who is undefeated, but only fought 30 bouts. That made a big fucking scene with uh, Conor McGregor. This is fucking ridiculous. Oh, okay, Hippo. Thanks for explaining. Okay. So Chavez 2 is the only Mexican uh, exclusive. I gotta make a note to uh, load that up on my EverDrive. After we finished uh, the original version, Boxing Legends of the Ring. Let's do Sound Shock. Sound Shock. Sound Shock. Sound Shock. Sound Shock. Mark Guinness, who worked on Virtual Bart for the Sega Mega Drive, and Aquas. Yes, Aquas was a uh, Aquas was a composer, Sega Mega Drive games and sculpture software. Aquas made uh, The Simpson, Bart's Nightmare, and WWF Royal Rumble, and also WWF Super WrestleMania. That uh, you, you saw me play the WWF Royal Rumble four five years ago, WWF Super WrestleMania a couple months ago. Uh, so Mark Gannis and Aquas are credited for this soundtrack. Aquas's true name is actually Dean Morell. Now, what we already covered, what was there about Dean Morel that we could find, we could find. This is the first chance to talk about Mark Guinness. Right. Mark Guinness, on the left, is an American composer hailing from Salt Lake City, Utah, and is most known for his work on the Call of Duty series during the latter half of the 2000s, from Call of Duty 2 to Modern Warfare 2. He worked as an audio technician at NASA. From August 1989 to May 1991, then in November 91 he started working for Sculpture Software, where he would remain even after the Acclaim acquisition. On February 2003 though, he would leave, and in the next year he would join Infinity Ward to work on their Call of Duty games. <laughs> 